ton of, of those lefty bats that Keegan Rothrock's going to have to adjust to earlier in this ball game. The first pitch from Rothrock misses for ball one. You could not ask for a more beautiful night here in Gainesville. 71 degrees at first pitch. This is for a ball. It's 2 0 to Newland. Sunshine. No precipitation in the forecast for this three game series that will take us through Monday nights. Perfect. Rob Rock misses again. It's 3 0. You're going to see her mix some speeds as well so far in this at bat. She's thrown pitches in the mid 60s, but also in the high 50s. Just trying to find her timing with her release point right now. There's a strike. It's three and one. Nails that outside corner. A lot of powerful bats in this LSU offense, so you don't want to over adjust. You don't want to bring that pitch right over the heart of the plate because there are a ton of batters that will make you pay. That misses for ball four. And Newland is aboard to get things started for LSU. And Beth Torina, the Florida alum now in her 13th season at LSU outstanding team 30 and 4 on the season remember they started the year 24 and 0 the last team to suffer a loss in college softball in division one this year and she's really excited about this team this year of course because there are so many veterans top to bottom names that are so familiar with this LSU program here's one of those names Ciara Briggs who takes strike one the grad student playing center field at 363 on the season. Briggs went four for 10 with four runs scored in last weekend's series against Texas A&M. Briggs bunts, and that will move Newland over to second one away. Nice sacrifice bunt by Sierra Briggs. She has so much speed that even when she's laying down a sacrifice bunt, the defense has to work very quickly to make sure that they get her out over at first base. But a job well done moving Allie Newland over into scoring position. And that brings up Taylor Pleasance. As Maddie mentioned, 34 runs batted in for Pleasance. Her first plate appearance has a runner in scoring position. It takes ball one. You saw the walk-off home run for Pleasance against Texas A&M just a moment ago. She was two for seven in the series with a couple of runs batted in. It was her 43rd career home run. One and one. That was a tough battle in that ball game, too, against Emily Kennedy for Texas A&M, who throws the ball consistently from the left side, 70, 71 miles per hour. Pleasance had struggled on that curveball throughout that game and finally got a hold of one when they needed it most. Lays off that pitch up in the zone. It's two and one. Pleasance and LSU swept that A&M series. First ever sweep over the Aggies. Off the plate, it's three and one. I'm no expert, but I don't think the fans like that call already early in I this was game. Is it Marty Abazician's <laughs> fan club making some noise early on? It does look like a ball, not by much. Marty's got the play tonight. Chris Neighbors, Robbie Guest on the bases. That one misses. Second walk of the inning for Rothrock. This is her 121st inning of work. That's a lot among the league leaders. And that is the 42nd walk she's issued. And an early conversation in the circle. Chelsea Dobbins, first year pitching coach for Florida. It's riding that fine line of not trying to be too careful with your pitches, but also being aware of where you're locating those rise balls. Chelsea Dobbins in her first season at the University of Florida. Head coach Tim Walton looking on in the dugout. Tim's team had a win on Thursday against Stetson. Their last SEC series was a wild one against Mississippi State in Starkville. They lost game one 13-12, one game two 8-5, one game three 7-6. They were down 6-2 in that game. They trailed in all three games of that series. Ended up winning two out of three. Even in that game that they lost, Mississippi State was trailing by six runs in the sixth inning before they were able to bounce back and win that ball game. Just back and forth, teams throwing punches left and right throughout that series. 
In talking to him before this series this weekend, I asked him, what was it that you learned about your team going through a battle like that down in Starkville, Mississippi? And he said that he learned that this team is full of a bunch of competitors. And that's something that you want to see, not just for the regular season going through SEC play, but of course, moving on into the postseason, you want to have that fighting mentality, especially with a team with so many new faces, so many newcomers into the SEC. Gutierrez hammers it foul, and it's one and two. Raylene at 337, five home runs, 29 runs batted in. Last year, she was at 285 with one homer and 18 runs batted in. Always known for her defense, outstanding at first base, but she's matched it with her run production and play production this year. It's a whole new era, aura of confidence when she steps into the box. Off the plate, it's two and two. So far, LSU being very disciplined for these lefties on the outside part of the plate. Not missing by much. That's a tough take when you're behind with a two-strike count. Do the 2-2 again. Gutierrez has just been spraying the ball so well to all fields. I find that looking back at her swings from previous years, there's just something about her, her lower half and her swing. It's a lot more calm, a lot more compact, and she's driving the ball with a lot more authority this season. Count goes full. Three and two to Gutierrez with two on and one down here in the first. Rothrock working here in the first inning. Ground ball to Wallace to second for one on the first. Won't be in time. Two down. And Williams got the force at second, Maddie, but not enough time to get the double play. Defense is something else that's going to stand out in this series. Both teams have great defense, especially in the middle infield. Skylar Wallace trying to turn the 6-4-3 double play, but Gutierrez hustles down that first baseline just to barely beat out that throw. Bit of an off-balance throw by Mia Williams, too, having to get rid of that one in a hurry. Here's Kelly Lynch. Takes ball one. Both teams excellent defensively. Outfield defense really good for both teams as well. But when you think of Florida, you think of just total defense. Fielding percentage 980, which is first in the conference. Foul back and out of play. It's 101. You know, Eric, I feel like we, we talk about it year after year. What is it that when you're facing a team like Florida, what is it that makes them so consistently difficult year after year? And I always go back to the defense. They're a team that's just not going to hurt themselves defensively, so you have to earn your way on base. Tapped back to the pitcher, Rothrock on the first. She works out of the jam, and LSU, Akalowski and Mia Williams. Kendra Falby steps in at 4.27 on the season, third in the SEC and slaps the first pitch wide of third for strike one. Some video game numbers for these Florida <laughs> batters right there at the top of the order. And not like it gets much easier in this lineup too when you've got somebody like Reagan Walsh hitting as well as she has the past couple of games. One and one. Madison Kennedy's having a good year for Mississippi State, especially with the power numbers, but when it comes to average, there's no topping the top four for Florida right now. And as a team, third in Division One at 368 team batting average. It's pretty interesting when you look at this list, too, because you've got Skylar Wallace, and who can really do it all from the left side. You've got Kendra Falby, who slaps and hits and bunts. That's off the base. It's a fair ball, and it'll hit into the outfield. Falby's got great speed, looking for the double. The throw's in there, but not in time, and Falby using that speed well. She's at second to lead things off for the Gators. I was just talking about how she can do it all from the left side between the bunting and the slapping, and I, I left out the part where she can strategically hit first base <laughs> with a ball put that in play. That was the next thing you were going <laughs> to say. Yeah. I was leading straight up to this hit out in right field, but the explosive speed that she has as she rounds first base, sliding into Ooh. second base, she actually slides straight into Taylor Pleasance, who's covering second base. That tag got up on her shoulders pretty quickly, and... Taylor Pleasance taking a moment here. She's smiling. It looks like she's okay. 
a bit of a late slide going into yes. second base on that play. I, th I wonder if Beth is going to challenge this. I think she got her before. I mean, the, the legs get twisted up, and you can see Pleasance right away with her reaction because it was a hard slide. Tarina is wondering more about the contact at second instead of challenging it. I don't think if she challenged, it looks like she would win the challenge. Did, did Falby get her, her feet in there? Because that tag got up high on the shoulders. I, I was wondering the same thing. Which part of Kendra Falby's leg hit the base first? Because from those views, it almost looked like it wasn't until her knee yes. hit the bag yeah. that something hit second base. So Pleasant seems to be okay. And here is Skylar Wallace, leading hitter in the SEC at 479. And by the way, her on-base percentage, 630, tops in Division I. Let's take you back to that, that slide from Falby. So the tag's put on right on the helmet. Yeah. And, and it doesn't... From that angle, it doesn't look like the right knee made contact with the base. Now, let me bring in something else here. As it's grounded, look for Falby, very aggressive on the base pass, and she's out, and Tim Walton wants to challenge this call because he thinks Falby got under on the slide. Pleasance tried to get Falby, and this is what Florida's got speed. They'll be aggressive on the base pass. You saw that with Falby going to second on the ball that just dribbled into the outfield. They're going to look for any opportunity to take an extra 60 feet. This one, a very aggressive move by Kendra Falby trying to advance from second base because this ground ball is hit right in front of her to Taylor Pleasance. It looks like she's out. I think she got her on the kneecap. Yeah. Back to that previous play when we saw that second angle when Falby slid into Pleasance. But I thought she was making a play on the ball. I think that's the right call. Kendra Falby being called out over at third base. It looked like that tag was applied in plenty of time as she slid in. And you saw a little change in the mechanics for the umpires on how they handle replay. There's a bit of a communication issue with Birmingham, so they are going over together to, to look at the monitor, make the review, instead of doing the point-to-point -point communication on the field. Just a small thing, but they still have a look at all the angles that they need to see. And they're still able to get that video review in very quickly yep, that as was well. Very quick. So Florida down to one challenge remaining. And here's Corby Otis. We mentioned impact transfers. Well, here come two of those impact transfers. Otis from Louisville and Jocelyn Erickson. The impact transfer from Oklahoma having fantastic first seasons with the Gators. One and two. When you talk about newcomers, you mix in the freshmen, Rothrock and Brown, the freshmen, and then you have Erickson and Otis. That's all for foot foul ball. I think there were a lot of people, my, myself included, coming into this season not really knowing what to expect from this Florida team just because they had so many newcomers, so many freshmen, so many transfers. You just never know what that's going to look like when you get a team put together. But I feel like they have performed in every facet of the game. Maybe in the circle, offensively. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And plus, you've got veteran leadership from people like Skylar Wallace. Even somebody like Reagan Walsh and, and Kendra Falby who have been around the league for several years now. Swung on and missed. Otis was retired, two down. Good looking drop ball here from Sidney Burzon. Really heavy drop ball down in the zone. Look at the way it just falls off of the table as it hits right on the ground in front of Bajoran, back behind the plate. A good looking pitch, a lot of bite already on that drop ball from Burzon. I'll bring up Jocelyn Erickson, fourth in the SEC in hitting. Now, Wallace obviously is a threat to steal, the leader in the SEC with 24 stolen bases on the season. You can see just how the infield reacts after every single pitch, too, automatically going to cover, knowing that she could take off at any pitch. There she goes. Here's the throw. It's high, and Wallace is in 
safely. One of the things to watch today would be the battle for the speed from the Gators against how LSU has been able to control the run game for opponents. Rudy uh, Bajoran, rather, behind the plate has been outstanding. That's just the fifth successful stolen base against her this year. In the dirt, Wallace will take third on the wild pitch. And that's something that this speed from Florida is going to do. It's going to put constant pressure on the defense to, quite frankly, be perfect out there. Whether it's the pitcher hitting their spots back behind the plate, the catcher catching things perfectly, making great throws down to the bases, because they will exploit at any turn with that speed that they have throughout the lineup. That's a ball, and Erickson's aboard, runners on the corners. You can see the, the sharp white uniforms for the Gators with the sunflower stirrups here on a sunflower Saturday, then Skyler Wallace had to go ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Skyler's uh, not going with that description of the stark white uniforms quite anymore. That didn't take very long, but one trip around the bases. Here's Katie Kistler, one of those veterans. Having a good year at 377 on the season. Big rip, and it's one and one. Chopped foul. One and two with two down here in the first. Kessler lays off, it's two and two. Katie Kissler is one of those veterans too. You think back to her freshman year was used primarily as a pinch runner and just worked her way into the starting lineup back in 2022 and has continued to get better year after year. Swung on and missed. Burzon gets the strikeout. That is her. Beth has mentioned and she talked to us this morning about it again today too. They were trying to find the right way to make the lineup work because Danica was such an impactful piece of that lineup. And I think when you have somebody like Danica Coffey out for the season, you try to figure out how you're going to make up for the offensive production and the defensive production that she provides game in and game out and maybe tried to, to over adjust, ended up changing a lot of things within the lineup, but tried to go back to what makes this LSU team so good, having somebody like Sierra Briggs in the two hole. Carly Petty with a fly ball, Falby has it, one away. And Coffey this year, sixth in the SEC at 404, on base percentage of 500, or OPS nearly 1,200. So you talk about an impactful bat, and you can see what she's done throughout her career. ACL injury on March 2nd. She had surgery a few weeks ago, starting third baseman. Eligible to return next season, which is good news. She's not with the team on this trip. So if you're watching back in Baton Rouge, Danica, you are missed. <laughs> and I know you're thrilled that the team has been doing pretty well here lately, winning six in a row, getting back on track. Just such a stark contrast for this team, how they started the season. Rudity sends it out to left field and to foul ground, and Corby Otis has it, quickly two down for LSU here in the second. I think it, it opened everybody's eyes when you look at a team like LSU starting off the season 24-0, and and then all of a sudden losing four in a row, all mm -hmm. in a bunch. But for them, a, a great learning point for this team moving forward too. And that's the benefit of having so many veterans in this lineup, right? You're, they're not going to panic if they lose a couple of games in a row, but they're going to try to figure out how to get things back on track. And I think we're starting to see this LSU team start to fire on all cylinders as we get deeper into this conference play this season. A lot of bats coming alive, the pitching solid in the circle. Bajoran pops it up. Erickson, the catcher, calls for it. Strat win start for the Gators against just five losses, seven and two in the SEC. That Oklahoma State game was a tough one, too, with somebody like Lexi Kilfoyle in the circle for the Cowgirls, that heavy drop ball. Tough game that this young team has just continued to learn and grow game after game, and this is an offense that truly is powerful, top to bottom, with a lot of speed. They're tough to defend. 
Just not a lot of holes, one through nine. And there for a strike to Reagan Walsh. Aggregate runs in that Mississippi State st series, 27-24. Now, normally you'd say the Florida gave up 24 runs. What was wrong? Well, there was the sun was in play, the wind was in play. There were some <laughs> things that were a little bit beyond their control. And but Mississippi over, State's hitting the ball really that, well, too. <laughs> that is the thing that you should take away from that. Mississippi State is a team that can score some runs. We've seen that so far for Mississippi State this season. Madison Kennedy up to 15 home runs already this season. We already saw she's batting over 400. We'll do the 2-2 again to Reagan Walsh. We talk about the veterans for LSU. The Mississippi State team has a lot of veterans, too, between Madison Kennedy, of course. You've got Paige Cook over there as well. Matalasi Faapito is another one. They're having a good weekend in Columbia. They've shut out. South Carolina back-to-back -back games, including today. Chop to second, Petty onto Gutierrez, and three o'clock on, e on ABC tomorrow, and the Bird and Tarazi show will be on ESPN tomorrow. They'll be up to their hijinks. I think hijinks kind of aptly describes what those two are up to. <laughs> Softly hit back behind the circle, a lot of spin on it, and doing well with it is Petty to get the out, two down. Not an easy play there for Petty having to charge. That ball hit off of the end of the bat, so it had a ton of spin, actually hopped and kicked the opposite direction. But there's that solid defense that we've been talking about on both sides of the field already showing off. Yeah, we talked about Florida being number one in fielding percentage. LSU is number three. And they've committed 23 errors, which is the third fewest in the SEC. Three freshmen in the bottom of the lineup for Florida, Brown, Kowalewski, and Williams. Here is Ariel, the third baseman at 289 on the season. Burzon fielding her position. Quick inning for her in the circle. And the fans know to bring out the yellow. I, I know you love researching and watching games, and I, I, there's probably someone watching, an SEC fan who knows the answer to this, does Florida have the most uniform, sock, hat, you name it, combinations? They're fans <laughs> as well. You know, like they, they got to be in line. They got to have their sunflowers out for Saturday, which is an awesome look. That one's fouled off by Maddox McGee, leading off here for LSU. Unofficially, I'm going to go with yes. I don't know the exact for the number Florida on the uniform, uniform combos. combos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying to think of other teams <laughs> that would have more uniform combos. Now I'm going outside of the SEC. My mind goes to Oregon. Oh yeah, thinking about o Oregon. their uniform yeah. combinations. How many uniform combinations did you have in your playing days at Tennessee? And I'm gonna I'm gonna set the over under it. Two. <laughs> hey, <yeah. laughs> Road in a home. <laughs> well, the bunches are different. Three. At least three. Okay. See, now you've got me thinking about the, the hardcore stuff here. And it looks like Maddox McKee is going to be called for being out of the box. So if you have less than two strikes, you make contact with the pitch and you're out of the box. It just goes down in a strike. But because she had two strikes and she made contact while she was out of the box, let's take a look. Yep, that left foot as it crosses over, it goes outside of the box across that chalk line. And so that's recorded as out number one. Recorded as catcher unassisted. And here is Allie Newland back to the top of the order for LSU. Newland walked and was left stranded at third in the first. I know you're going to laugh at me. I'm, oh. I'm over here making a diagram trying to figure out how many uniform combos. <laughs> I, I'm up to four. I got four. Four. My Tennessee. senior year, we ended up with, with orange pants as well. So that's where I'm getting the additional okay. uniform combo. So we had the orange pants, white uniform, a gray uniform, an orange top. Okay. So I think I'm up to four. Yeah. I feel like you're about 10 short of the Florida combo. Probably, <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Three and one to Newland. And she's aboard for the second time. It's a one out walk, her second walk of the evening. The Blue Jays decided to add a change up to his repertoire this year and it's been a very effective pitch for him out there on the mound. Now that's a little research thing you can do. What do most pitchers do after they throw a no-hitter? <laughs> I, I seem to, re you know what? I'm now thinking back to my baseball trivia. Why does Johnny Vandermeer come to mind as the only person to throw back-to-back no-hitters? Somebody Google search that for me on our research staff. That, now I'm showing my age. You're <laughs> laughing at me. Yeah. Slapped. Wallace gets up there to make the out. Great shortstop battle here in this series. Wallace for Florida. Pleasance for LSU. Wallace. Gets a highlight play, two down. And you'll see where Wallace is playing, too, right in between second and third base, respecting the flag, fact that Sierra Briggs will go to a slap, had to jump way up in the air, showing that vertical leap that she's got. A nice grab by Skylar Wallace over at shortstop, route number two. Here is Pleasance. I know it's a team matchup, but I'm sitting next to a former All-American shortstop who probably has a little extra smile on her face when she sees that the matchup at shortstop is pretty compelling here in Gainesville this weekend. And I think everybody's eyes, of course, go to the offensive numbers that both of these players are able to put up, but I love watching both of them play defense. And because they're two completely different heights and have different strengths at the same position, and yet they're both Extremely solid players. There's a strike, it's two and one. Of course, Pleasant's battle through injury last year. Still had a really good season. Both have had great careers for their teams. Popped up, guess who? Pleasant to Wallace to retire the side. Outs being made in different ways. As Mia Williams goes to show bunt for a base hit on the first pitch there, but a lot of ground ball outs for LSU and Sidney Burzon, and a lot of fly ball outs on the flip side for Keegan Rothrock. Williams fouls another one off. It's 0-2 to the freshman second baseman. Called strike three. Strikeout number three for Burzon, one away. Surprised that drop ball was called for a strike. This one looks way off of the plate, almost in that left-handed batter's box. And so far in this game, we've seen a pretty tight zone on the outer half of the plate. But Burzon's going to take that call any day. Top of the order, here's Falby. Falby doubled off the first base bag, leading off for Florida in the first. Back to the pitcher, Burzon. Two down. Interested to see, too, what Kendra Falby does in her at-bats following this one, because in both two at-bats to start off this game, she's been swinging away. And I wonder if that's because the infield is playing her so shallow rather than going to that slap. But a quick... Out number two for Burzon on that ground ball. I'll bring up Skylar Wallace with the bases empty. Strike one for Burzon. We'll have a conversation with Florida head coach Tim Walton after this half inning. One hop gloved by Petty, knocks it down, throws the first. And that right now, I mean, <laughs> you are making a fashion statement, my friend. Yeah, these are the uh, yellow, <laughs> the yellow game, uh, you know, custom kicks by Bailey Goddard, my uh, right fielder. Bailey does a great job. She's uh, got a great talent. 
She's done these for me for, uh, for her whole time career since she's been here. Uh, they look pretty good. Well, Coach, I leave Eric to the hard-hitting <laughs> questions. I'm going to turn to a softball question here. With the offense facing a heavy drop ball from Bruzon, what sort of adjustments do you want to see in their swings to try to lift something out to the grass? Yeah, I just, we just got to be on time for the drop ball. It's the one that's 68, 70 miles an hour. So if we're stuck, if, we're, if, we're, if we get stuck on the change or get stuck on the rise, we're going to have a harder time being able to elevate that pitch and leverage it a little bit better. But... Um, we just got to be on time. I think that maybe the shadows will help us a little bit. Once the shadows are gone, we can get on time a little bit more. But right now, last two hitters obviously hit the ball pretty firm. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate okay. it. Thank As you, guys. always. Go Gators. We thank Tim. We thank Bailey Goddard. Now, I'm now impressed. Maddie Shipman's wheels are turning a little bit. It's like, well, we're here for a three-game series. You, you I, know, I do love sneakers. I love sneak. You got your Jordans do, on today. I do have my Jordans on. And. Like, well, we're here for a few days. Maybe I can commission Bailey for a little <laughs> ESPN softball design. Ground ball right side to Williams. On to Brown. Quickly one away as Gutierrez is retired. I'm thinking already next trip to Gainesville, I'm going to have to bring down some plain white sneakers, see what Bailey Goddard can do well, with like them. I'm said, impressed. Well, like I said, we're here for three more days. I, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> we can time. find some somewhere <laughs> for you before Monday night. Let her turn her loose. Ball one to Kelly Lynch, who grounded back to Rothrock in the first. One on one. Rothrock has been very impressive. You knew Florida was in for a pitching reset just with how things had unfolded and losing players to graduation, but they just needed to get back to being dominant in the circle. And Rothrock, combined with Ava Brown, has given them a one two punch. Surprisingly, both freshmen, but making such a big impact. I think that was part of the indecision for some people looking at Florida. Well, is this a middle of the pack team in the SEC? But Tim Walt knew they were good. People in softball knew they were good, but you had to perform, and they have performed. There's just always that unknown factor when it comes to freshmen coming into a program because the jump is so steep going from high school or travel ball and getting to the college level and trying to see somebody thrown into a situation like this where really there is a lot of pressure on your shoulders to go out there and perform day in, day out, be the starting game one pitcher for Florida. And so far she has been really fantastic in that role and like you mentioned, working with Ava Brown too. And I really like that both of them complement each other as far as what they throw. So it's another element that these opponents are having to prepare for offensively when you face a team like Florida. Hard liner to Kowalewski at third, two down. I think for Rothrock, that Mississippi State series, you, you talked about the competitiveness for the Gators. That game three, she left in the second inning. She didn't have her best stuff. But she came back in the fourth inning and got the win. Ended up going five and two-thirds, gave up two earned runs, and threw 120 pitches. And having the, the realization, too, as a pitcher that you're not going to feel 100% every battle. single day. You're Gotta not battle. going to have every one of your pitches every single day, but how do you adjust? How do you battle within those types of games, especially a team like Mississippi State that was swinging the bat so incredibly well? How do you fight through some of those things, work the edges, rely on your defense, whatever it might be, to still be able to come out with a win? Popped up. On the infield, Kowalewski calls for it and in Knoxville with a walking boot on. So hopefully it's not a long-term injury, just a preventative measure. But no Kiki Malloy at the top of the order for Tennessee this weekend against Georgia. Corby Otis swings at the first pitch. Pleasant's on the first. Very quickly, one away. Eight in a row retired by Burzon. So this is game one of a Saturday evening doubleheader. Great one coming up after us. The continuation of the Red River rivalry. Game two of the series between Oklahoma and Texas in Austin. Oklahoma took game one of the series 5-2 on Friday night. Jada Coleman with the big blast for Oklahoma. So many players in that Oklahoma lineup, of course, having 
Another great year, Jada Coleman being one of those players that always seems to come through in the clutch for the Sooners. T.R.A. Jennings having a great year as well offensively. And then in the circle, there's someone by the name of Keely Maxwell who's having a great year, but for the first time having that great year for Oklahoma. She had 10 strikeouts in the win last night. Maxwell transferring from Oklahoma State to Oklahoma this season. A lefty that's had a lot of success throughout her career. Two and one to count to Jocelyn Erickson, who was the last Gator to reach base. She walked in the first. Burzon in control. Erickson, fly ball to shallow center field. Ciara Briggs comes in to put it away for out number two. This game is moving right along. It's all part of Madison's master plan of what she's doing today, tonight, and tomorrow morning. The next stop on the F1 schedule is the Japanese Grand Prix at the Fane Suzuka Circuit. It's at 1 a.m. tomorrow, which is later tonight if you want to look at it that way. So Maddie not setting alarm. She's just going to be ready and locked in on F1. The pre-race coverage is at midnight on ESPN2 just to get you started. Basically, if you have ESPN on all day, all night long, you get a little bit of F1, you get a little bit of softball, some baseball, more softball. Just a little bit of everything. All wrapped up into one weekend, Eric. Now, just remember, if you stay up and watch the entire Formula One race that takes you to about 3 a.m. Eastern time, we have a 1 p.m. start here tomorrow on ESPN2. I can multitask, though. I can get some softball work you're, done while I'm watching You're a mother that. of young kids. You're used to being sleep deprived. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Great point. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask Beth Tarina about who her favorite F1 driver is. Stick around and find out after this half inning. Misses to Kistler, it's two and two. This is for a ball, it's three and two. Burzon had all three wins in the Texas A&M series for LSU. First LSU pitcher with a three win weekend in 13 years. Off speed in there for strike three. Burzon continues to roll 10 in a row. Retire base coaching box proudly wearing the LSU colors. Let's talk about approach at the plate in a pitcher's duel so far. What's your message to your hitters to try to get something going against a talented freshman, Beth? Yeah, she is talented. What a year she's having. You know, what a year their entire team's been having. So um, I think we just have to keep working, keep sticking with our plan, and, you know, assume that it's going to come through. We've had a great offense all year, so uh, I'm confident they're going to figure it out here. And coach in the circle, Sydney Burzon, really rolling through the first couple innings of this ball game. We see that you're in constant communication with her after every half inning. What are you liking from her performance so far? I think she's doing a great job. I mean, she's been so solid for us all year. She's such a special pitcher. She can just do so many things with a softball. It's incredible. We're lucky to have her. So I think she's doing great. I hope she can keep going. All right, we let it get you back to work here, Beth. Thanks for your time. We Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's a great job by our crew. They bring the microphone and the headset out to the third base coach's box so Beth can just kind of relax my man Hank is just now Hank like Hank we're talking about you Hank knows Hank's got radar he knows when he's being <laughs> talked about <laughs> now he's just gonna go back into <laughs> his gotta make sure you get out of the way cubby. of some oh, of the no. foul balls Hank, right Hank's been around baseball and softball pro. for long enough to know you take cover so Got a little delay here. It looks like Erickson just has to make sure she's got the pitch comm all set. That electronic pitch communication is new to softball this year. Just on the defense, not offense yet, just defensively. You'll see them using the electronics to get the signals in from the dugout. Now, you've been broadcasting softball games for weeks and weeks back to Clearwater and Florida, and this is something that people have been watching softball are used to. But if you haven't been on top of softball from the beginning, this one is hit well to center field, but Falby's got plenty of room. And Rudity is retired. 
We talked to Beth Torina about it today. She loves it. You know, we're so used to seeing the shots in the dugout, you know, looking down, sending out the signals. And she mentioned, like, some pitcher said, well, I thought you said 1-3-4 instead of 1-3-3. You know, this leaves no doubt. The, keep, the electronic communication keeps things pretty clear for the team in the field. Yeah, before when you had the armbands, it was a charting system, mm -hmm. so you had to make sure everybody was on the right page. You, you really don't see catchers being crossed up near as often as you did last year. And most of all, it really helps with the pace of play. It keeps the game moving because the coaches are able to get those signals out to the defense and to the battery so quickly using the electronic communication. That's interesting. You saw Erickson taking a long look down at her wrists. Remember, there's a pitch clock as well that pitchers are adhering to. This one is fouled off. And out of play. You can see the pitch clock lower right. So after the foul ball, plate umpire gets set, gives the count, gives the ready to play, and now the clock starts ticking down. Rounded wide of third foul. Bajaran, 0 for 1 today. It was 3 for 10 in the AM series. Her RBI in game three tied things up with the Aggies. Rothrock Rock wanted it, didn't get it. This is a spot to both righties and lefties that sometimes we've seen it called in this game, sometimes we haven't. So that's a really close take outside for Bajaran. Fouled off. We'll do the 2 2 again. <laughs> Tap to first. Brown steps on the bag. Two down. Bit of a check swing there from Bonjeron just shows you how well Rothrock's mixing speeds and locations in that at bat just by itself. You saw a pitch working down in the zone, that off-speed pitch working almost like a drop ball. Then you've got a rise ball that she'll throw. That's the pitch that she gets the most swings and misses on throughout the season because of how much late jump that that pitch has on it. Number nine hitter Maddox McGee. Take strike one. Called out for being out of the box her first time. Takes the full swing, fouls it off, it's 0-2. Rothrock appeared in all three games against Mississippi State in that wild series. 11 and two-thirds of innings pitched. Gave up 14 hits and 10 earned runs. Went four innings against Stetson on Thursday. Didn't give up a run and just one hit, so. That set the stage for what she's done here today, and she's retired seven in a row right now. A couple of walks back in that first inning, got that pitch count up to 22, but she's been much more efficient as this game has gone on. Had the one walk again to Allie Newland in the third inning. But other than that, a lot of quick outs, some fly ball outs, a few ground ball outs mixed in there as well. Hit well to right and deep, and going back and making the catch is Kisler. Read it well off the bat. One of the better con either team. And just one hit. That was Falby's hit leading off the home half of the first inning that hit the first base bag and ended up going for a double. Here's Reagan Walsh grounded to second her first time. One on one. One thing Beth Torina talked to us about with Sydney Burzon was the fact that she can be what you need her to be as a pitcher. She can change on the fly. So she's got a lot going on right now. 
But now as she goes through the lineup a second time and maybe a third time, she can make different adjustments to how she pitches against batters and mixing in different pitches that you haven't seen earlier. It really gives her the ability to read what the opposing offense is trying to do against her. If you can see that all of their barrels are over-exaggerating, trying to get underneath that drop ball, well, that day she can turn into a rise ball pitcher. That is set through the right side, and it's a leadoff single for Reagan Walsh to get things going for the Gators here in the fifth. As Aaliyah Andrews just runs straight past her stop sign, <laughs> ends up scoring. <laughs> One of my favorite moments, though. So many good little tidbits that you learn about how the coaches interact with the teams within the game, too. It's always so much fun to be able to listen to that. You'll hear it all on Monday. Brown back to the pitcher. Burzon. All the way on that one. That was a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me laugh every single time. <laughs> Apparently, it's one of the crew's favorites because they had it queued they up and were, ready to go like, ready. <laughs> in a moment. <laughs> you know, I was about to say that's just great, uh, great producer. Aaron Owens is our producer, but he just said in my headset, that's outstanding producing. He beat you to it. <laughs> and, and I, now, now, really, should I say these things if he's pumping his own tires? Give me just a beat to pump your tires, Aaron. 1-1. One, one. Off speed, swing and a miss by Kowalewski. It's one and two. Really like that changeup that she's throwing because out of her hand, from a hitter's perspective, it looks like it's going to be that drop ball that she throws in the mid to high 60s. So that's why you're seeing so many swings out in front. Two and two. She does have that rise ball that's a bit off speed, kind of in between speeds between the drop ball and that changeup that she throws. So you really have to go up there and, and pick a speed and pick a location that you want to go after. Swung on and miss. Burzon gets her fifth strikeout, two down. We were just talking about how Burzon can adjust to what batters are doing to her. Typically known as a drop ball pitcher, look at the spin on this rise ball. It's moving up and away from the lefty. Fifth strikeout already on the afternoon. So recognizing that opportunities are going to be limited here tonight. Tim Walton will go to a pinch hitter here as Brooke Bernard will step in with two down and a runner in scoring position for the Gators. Strike one. Pinch hitting is never easy, but especially when you're coming in facing somebody like Burzon who can throw in so many different directions. Line foul. Smoke that one foul down the left side. A smile on Sydney's face in the circle. But you're really relying on the information that your teammates have gathered throughout the at-bat to try to help you when you step into the box. So it feels like you've been up to bat before. Utilizing all of that information, all the scouting, all the analytics to try to make a, a good decision. One and two. Rounded the second, Petty to first, and that swings at the first pitch and pops it up to Wallace. One pitch, one out. One down here in the sixth. A reminder, Sunday night baseball tomorrow. The Astros and the Rangers at 7 Eastern time. See it here on ESPN, also on ESPN Deportes. And hear it on ESPN Radio. Our coverage starts at 6 Eastern with Baseball Tonight, Sunday Night Countdown. Sierra Briggs with one down in the sixth. Takes ball one. Briggs sacrificed in the first. That was when LSU had their threat. Newland started the inning with a walk. Briggs sacrificed her to second. Pleasance walked. Newland moved to third on the fielder's choice, but Rothrock got Lynch to ground out back to the pitcher, and that was it for the threat. Since then, just one base runner for LSU, and that was Newland's walk in the third. Freshman has been outstanding in her first game against LSU. Showdown between two top 10 programs. 
Beth Torina's team starting the year 24-0 before losing four in a row, but they have bounced back with six straight wins. And they are 30-4 on the season. Framed by Erickson, doesn't get the call, it's 3-1. and one. That outside corner has been a bit elusive so far in this ball game. Coach Tim Walton not happy about not getting the call on that pitch, low and away. Briggs swings at the 3-1, fouls it out of play. Count goes full to the grad student. Tap back up the middle, and there is the first hit of the night for LSU. Ciara Briggs on a 3-2 pitch gets the base hit with one down here in the sixth. And she's one of those lefties that can really do it all. She can slap, she can bunt, she can hit away, but because of the threat of the slap and the speed, the infield for Florida was pulled in. Skylar Wallace was in between the base path between second and third base. She got that one off the end of the bat, but got it enough to drive it back up the middle. Taylor Pleasant swings at the first pitch and fouls it off. LSU does not steal a ton, 33 stolen bases on the season. That's eighth in the SEC, but Briggs is the team leader. 11 stolen bases and 12 attempts. One and one. One and two. I like that Rothrock's challenging Taylor Pleasance on the inside part of the plate too with that rise ball. Pleasance puts her toes right on the edge of the chalk line. Look at the location of this pitch here, up and inside. That's not an easy pitch to get your barrel out in front to get that barrel extended on that pitch coming on up and underneath your hands. Off the glove of the pitcher, and everybody's going to be safe. Williams had no play, first and second with one down here in the sixth. Bit of tough luck here for Rothrock. A couple of balls hit right off the end of the barrel that have just found holes on the infield. This one hits right off of her glove, and it looks like it's going to deflect straight to Mia Williams. But that extra couple of steps gives Taylor Pleasance enough time to beat out that ground ball down to first base, and now two on board for the Tigers. Gutierrez steps in. Takes ball one. Tim Walton will come. You can see Skylar Wallace pinched up the middle. And on the hands, fouled off, it's one and one. There's that good location. You can see LSU continuing to swing at that pitch. And even the look on Gutierrez's face right there, I think that was a look of probably shouldn't have swung at that pitch up and inside. Let's that one go. It's two and one. Rothrock threw 22 pitches in the first inning, but seven in the second, 18 in the third, 10 in the fourth, 14 in the fifth. But working here in the sixth. Just missed, it's three and one. Count now full to Gutierrez. Rothrock hasn't found herself Ahead of too many counts, she's fallen behind quite a bit. Not a ton of first pitch strikes that have been thrown in this ball game, but she's been able to battle back within these at bats, really working the inside part of the plate to both the righties and the lefties. 
Gutierrez taps it. This is going to stay in fair ground. Here comes the runner around third, and LSU has the game's first run. Briggs with that speed, never even tapped the brakes rounding third, and LSU is on top here in the sixth. Some heads up base running on a ground ball that didn't even leave the infield. Another hit that is not hit hard off of the bat, but look at the way Sierra Briggs rounds third base, doesn't hesitate at all, sees that nobody's covering that ground ball. Everybody was playing back, respecting the power that Raylene had up at the plate. It exactly. Had because it was another one, like you said, three hits this inning. It's not like we're talking about barreled up pitches no, here. No, no. <laughs> They're just, they just happen to be finding the right spots on the infield. Grounded to Wallace. They get the force at third. They did give an error to Rothrock on that previous play that allowed Briggs to score. I'm usually pretty tough in my scorebook too, but I don't know if I saw an error on that play. Briggs, we saw clearly in the replay and we saw in real time, she was she was coming. She was going that, no matter that what. That was a go, go, go from <laughs> Beth three to not a no, no, no. <laughs> yes, unlike the clip that we saw from Mike Up Monday a few years ago. But heads up base running of knowing where the defense was starting too. Everybody was playing back, especially the corners. Alan Giglio comes on to run. This one is hit well in the center field. It is carrying to the track, to the wall. Falby up and brings it down for the out. In the sixth, they have a one nothing lead. Now the top of the order for Florida. And Falby off the glove of the third baseman has a leadoff single for the Gators here in the bottom half of the sixth inning. Hard hit off of McGee. Getting deeper into this game, and now the third time through the order. This is the time for Florida to start to make adjustments. This is a check swing hit hard off of the bat. Straight past the glove of Maddox McKee over at third base. But now you've got speed on the base paths for the Gators. And power at the plate with Wallace. Falby's now two for three. Wallace is 0 for two. One on one. That base hit for Falby too, a product of the defensive shift by the infield, respecting the speed that Falby has coming from the left side. A lot of speed at the top of this order for Florida. Already saw Skylar Wallace steal a base today. Kendra Falby, another stolen base threat for the Gators. Already 14 stolen bases so far this season. Three and one. It's one of the big questions in SEC softball or college softball. What do you do with Skylar Wallace? <laughs> do you go right after her? That's off the glove of Burzon. Wallace has great speed. No throw from Pleasance. Similar to how LSU got it done. Two balls off the glove of infielders. Two hits here for the Gators. Down one in the sixth. You asked me, Eric, how you pitch to Skylar Wallace, and the analytics are going to tell you to throw the ball down in the zone. Well, Sydney Burzon does that, and Skylar Wallace still manages to find her way on base. Chops it hard into the ground, beats it out over to first base. Now two aboard with nobody away. Defensive outfield for LSU. Anything in the gap, and we've seen Skylar Wallace through the year, she can score from first. So it's going to be... A lot of pressure on that outfield as well to try to keep Wallace from scoring if Otis can get it out of the infield. Action in that LSU pen, Strude and Lynch. Otis 0 for 2. This is a ground ball up the middle and through, base hit. Here comes Falby, here's the throw, it gets away. Wallace is going to third, Otis is going to second. Florida has tied it and they're not done here in the sixth.
Corby Otis, the transfer from Louisville, come to Florida this year, gets this drop ball on the end of the bat. It's an outside pitch that she drives straight back up the middle out to Sierra Briggs out in center field. Tries to make a play on this one, but that throw way offline. Kendra Falby with way too much speed coming into home. You can just see how fired up Kendra Falby is as she slides in safely. One of those players that just exudes passion every single time that she steps on the field. Here is Erickson. Five for 12, three home runs, nine runs batted in in the Texas A&M series. 0 for 1 with a walk here today. 1 and 1. Erickson has been red hot at the plate. She has been a run producer, and she has two in scoring position with nobody out. Popped up. Pleasance on the infield. Big out there, one down. It's a clutch pitch for Eric for Burzon going up against Erickson. And Erickson is somebody who does extremely well in the lower part of the zone, but that's another example of Burzon just adjusting to the, pit, the batter that she's facing up in the box. Taking a little bit off of that, you could see with Erickson's swing, she was way out in front. Nice easy fly ball out for out number one. Katie Kistler struck out twice against Burzon tonight. Pops up the first pitch to Gutierrez. Skyler Wallace was halfway down the line, and Tim Walton was halfway down the line with her, trying to tell her to get back to the bag. Two down. He had to use those really nice sneakers to try to beat <laughs> Skyler Wallace down that third baseline. I'm not sure if she thought that that ball was going to drop in between second base and right field, but she took off for home plate, but luckily was able to get back into third base safely. Now with Reagan Walsh up at the plate. Walsh one for two. She swings at the first pitch and paid the price. Took a big cut at that one. Looks like maybe that foul ball might have hit her back leg. Oof, yeah, right on the back foot, back looks like. Of that right foot. Ah. Ooh, that one does not feel good. Generally, that's a spot where you would not think to put any protection or bedding on. No. <laughs> no one. That is hammered foul, and Walsh is down the count 0 and 2. And Walsh has had one of the best swings that we've seen off of Burzon throughout this game. Hit a drop ball that was way low and outside for a base hit to start off the bottom of the fifth inning. She's somebody who has really improved in her ability to hit pitches low in the zone this season. It's always interesting to compare batters heat maps year after year and when you look at Walsh and where she did majority of her damage the previous two seasons, a lot more damage being done up in the zone this year. A lot of damage, a lot of her extra base hits coming from pitches that are down in the zone, specifically low and outside. Just foul. We got to pick Coach Beth Tarina's brain a bit about pitch calling against certain batters and what she likes to look for. And I guarantee that swing that Reagan Walsh took back in the fifth inning is a big reason why she's seeing a heavy dose of those drop balls low and inside in this at bat. Four straight foul balls off the bat of Walsh. Goes up top, Walsh lays off. This one is hit deep to left field. It is back. It is gone. It was a pitcher's duel in this ball game until the offenses broke things open here in the sixth inning. This is a changeup, low and outside. Look at the way that Reagan Walsh sinks into that front leg to get extension, to get around that outside pitch and launch that thing over the left field wall. 
What a big moment for Reagan Walsh in her 13th home run this season. That leads the Gators, grounded by Brown to Gutierrez to retire the side. Floor. And all the damage done for the Gators in that bottom of the sixth inning. Avery Gels takes over at first place, outstanding, at first base rather, outstanding defensive player in the field here as Florida with a three run lead trying to put it away. Mackenzie Rudity is 0 for 2. One and two. Scoreless through five, LSU broke the ice in the top half of the sixth inning. Florida broke through in the bottom of the sixth. Four runs for the Gators to take a 4-1 lead. Reagan Walsh still celebrating over in that dugout with her teammates. Rothrock still trying to work that rise ball into these LSU batters. Zero swings and misses so far in today's ball game. Crowd does not like that one called for a ball outside. Looked like a ball out of the hand. Nice frame back there by Jocelyn Erickson trying to pull that one in for a strike. Ground ball to second. Williams on to Gills, one away. Another ground ball out for LSU in this ball game too. It's been a fairly even mix of ground ball outs and fly ball outs for their offense against Rothrock and they just seem to be off time with the way that she's been able to mix speeds with her pitches. And that rise ball is typically the pitch that she gets the most swings and misses on. They haven't been missing them, they just haven't been squaring them up. Ball one to Bajaran. Rothrock on the season, Maddie, 124 strikeouts and 120 innings of work entering tonight. That's good for fourth in the SEC, but LSU is a team that is the best in the SEC with fewest strikeouts with 89. So they haven't struck out here today, but to your point, there hasn't been solid contact against Tim Walton's freshman pitcher throughout tonight. She's doing just enough by mixing speeds, by keeping her pitches on the edges of the strike zone to where LSU hasn't been able to consistently square anything up. And I also think that because she's not getting ahead in these at-bats every single time, she's not just pumping in strike after strike, I do think that as an offense, it kind of keeps you on your heels a bit when the pitcher looks like they're a little wild out there in the circle. And here another three ball count to Bajoran. There's a strike. See that pitch coming in at 63 miles per hour. She will throw her rise up there 68, 69 miles per hour at times as well. That misses for ball four. So LSU has a runner aboard with one down here in the seventh. Came in the final four last night in Cleveland. We'll see that championship game on ABC tomorrow. Maya Townsend running for LSU at first. Pitch number 102 from Rothrock to the number nine hitter. Ground ball to second. They get the out at first. Two down, and LSU's down to their final out. This is game one of our Saturday night softball doubleheader here on ESPN. Oklahoma, the number one team in the country, standing by in Austin to take on Texas. It was a win for the Sooners in game one of the series on Friday night. Jada Coleman with a three-run home run, the big shot. You can see game two of the Red River rivalry matchup between Oklahoma and Texas at the top of the hour. Their final Big 12 meeting in the regular season, by the way. That will be an SEC rivalry next year. Hard to believe that both these teams will be in the SEC next year. Both those teams, excuse me, I should say. Newland towards the gap, it's getting down in a hurry. Here comes the runner around third, and LSU makes it a 4-2 game, and they will get the tying run to the plate here in the seventh. 
Allie Newland making an intentional adjustment to get on top of the rise ball. Over-exaggerate, get your barrel on top of that pitch. It's got such late bite to it, you have to anticipate where that pitch is going to end up. It probably would have ended up being a ball, but look at the way that her hand path stays on top of that ball, drives it out into that left center gap to score another Tiger run. To get the scoring started for LSU. Another rise ball up in the zone, 65 miles per hour. Coach Tim Walton did say that he wanted to see the level of communication increase for his team as they go on in the season. I think that timeout was a prime example of some of the veterans on this team trying to take charge, show their leadership by calling time, slowing things down, and communicating about where they want to play defensively before things happen. Two and one. Briggs does have two home runs on the season. Close pitch outside. That one didn't miss by much. The 2-1. LSU down to their final strike. Florida fans begin to rise here at Presley Stadium. Called strike three, the Gators take game one of the series.